Well, hi, New Life Covenant Church and our viewers around the world. I uh, thank you for joining us on our online church. Uh, since we've had our challenges with COVID-19 church closing, we've been online for a while, and we want to thank you for your support. You know, the online program is so important because there are individuals who are unable to be in church for all kinds of reasons, especially here in Zimbabwe. But to New Life Covenant churches uh, in Zimbabwe, and particularly in Harare, thank you for your support. Uh, we are consistently raising money for all kinds of avenues to keep the ministry going, for keeping uh, the staff uh, and the office going. But again, Kingdom Cathedral is a very important aspect of our ministry, and we want to thank you for sowing and giving. On the screen are places you can give and support. Please continue to work with us. Uh, we're hoping that as the uh, country opens a bit more and more, the city opens a bit more and more, we'll be able to accommodate you in our services. Nine o'clock and 11 o'clock every Sunday. Thank you for your support. We love you guys, and we'll see you week after week after week. In your presence, oh God, we, we have all we need. That's why we're calling upon. On your name, oh God.
church say we know there is more that's found in you it's in you Lord it's in you Lord we know there is more that's found in you you gotta sing with conviction that everything I need is in you oh Lord we find it in you Good morning, New Life Covenant Church and all our viewers around the world. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. Pastor Chichi and I, our leaders, have such joy in bringing these services to you. Thank you for watching online. For those of you in the flesh, thank you for being here in person. We thank God for you. Amen. All of you in the auditorium, can you clap your hands as a sign of praising the Lord? Take your seats if you can. Just a few things we want to mention to you. Firstly, um, Sunday morning services are continuing for the time being. Uh, only with uh, those that can produce uh, vaccination cards are allowed entry into the building. When that changes, we will change with it. Uh, thank you for coming. Also, uh, for those online, make sure that you're watching and keeping abreast with the things we are teaching and the journey we're taking. October is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, specifically, it's directed to women, but men also have challenges with uh, breast cancer. And so we are encouraging the women to please take care and to please uh, take special care. If you have any challenge in this regard, anything you are unsure of, please go through our information desk, go through reception. They can direct you to many of our able doctors. We have the various channels through which they can direct you and you can get assistance. Prevention is always better. Catch it early. Uh, and I'm watching the women. There's a handful of women focusing on what I'm saying. You're hearing, but you're not listening. The announcement is designed for you. And so uh, if you are here and you have an older sister, an aunt, a mother, and so on, please just probe them a little bit for something that is so, so preventable. And uh, it's better to cure than to go through a horrendous, horrendous challenge. Amen. All right, let's go to chapter... Uh, let's go to Psalm 61. Let's go to Psalm 61. Let's change my message a bit this morning. Psalm 61. King James Version. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. Father, thank you for your word in Jesus' name. There's 150 psalms, all of them significant, phenomenal in their own way. And uh, a very responsible leader who began a men's leadership, global men's leadership, Dr. Edwin Lewis called the late great Ed Cole, would advise men uh, to read Proverbs in the morning and then in the evening read from the book of Psalms because Proverbs gives you wisdom for the day and Psalms replenishes what you've expended and ex what you've expended and used during the day. And uh, you can go through several Psalms in an evening 
They don't take long, really. You can do from Psalm 1, basically to Psalm 20, very quickly. Uh, there are some that are very long, but all of them have significant messages. The book of Psalms is divided into five specific categories. The first category is what is called laudatory, L-A-U-D-A-T-O-R-Y, laudatory. To laud means to instruct. It means to uh, instruct in praise. And so when, when we have a laudatory psalm, we are instructing, we are teaching in demonstration and through words how to praise God. God has a way in which he wants to be worshipped. There are ways in which he instructs us to come before him. We come before him with singing, with thanksgiving. We come before him with reverence and honor and respect. And so when we express our praise and uh, we give our commendation to the Lord for the things he, have done, he has done, that's in the category of laudatory praise. Uh, today, we had praise. We went into worship. Not enough because of time. Uh, as the months roll by, we'll be having special services. We will announce that I just praise and worship expressions. Praise and worship draws us close to God, and God inhabits the praise of his people, Psalm 22. Praise and worship does not build faith. It's the word of God that builds faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. The second category of psalms are called historical psalms. Historical, where the psalm itself begins to relate something that took place with reference to... Uh, a human being and almighty God. So there are psalms that will go back as far as Abel. Psalms will mention uh, events as far back as Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, but a lot around Moses because uh, he was author of some and uh, basically around King David and his chief praises, Asaph and others who wrote phenomenal uh, pieces of music, um, many uh, pieces of music that these individuals wrote because there was a classification of groups that served in the temple to present skillful praise, skillful worship, skillful music, uh, skilled on, on all kinds of instruments, skilled dances with uh, vestments and garments that were made to the very best order. And so historical psalms will capture some of those events. Uh, my favorite category of psalms are didactic psalms, D-I-D-A-C-T-I-C, -D -I -I didactic psalms. These are intended to teach, particularly in moral, having moral instruction, and also to expose social injustice, to expose demonic and spiritual injustice. So where the enemy has given you trouble, the psalm then exposes that and then gives a remedy as to how the request is for God to avenge the injustice perpetrated on an individual. And so there are some psalms that will say, smash the teeth of the enemy. Uh, avenge me of those that chase me. And uh, these didactic psalms not only are good for uh, building faith, but they are good for, for growing you in one's experience with Almighty God. And then the fourth category of psalms are prophetic psalms, where the psalm generally prophesies what's coming. There are many, many messianic psalms that prophesy a Messiah. They talk about not just his birth, his life, uh, talk about his deeds, his salvation. They talk about some of the works that he will do and the works that he will uh, present and bring into the earth. 
And those prophetic psalms where uh, David wrote he was actually taken in the spirit and he enjoyed a short dispensation of being under the law, in the law, but not subject to the law. And so there are things that David, David did that were heinous and difficult and challenging. But God always made a way of forgiveness for King David because of the dispensation David was living in. And then the last set of psalms are praise and worship psalms. Most of these are seen from about Psalm 135 all the way to Psalm 150 where we are instructed to give God praise and worship and the things that praise and worship will do in our psalms. Psalm 149, Psalm 150 are some of the very best and we can see a very large array of the kinds of instruments that David had uh, that he utilized and perfected as a means of offering skilled and, and uh, specific praise and worship to Almighty God. Uh, God was always after a man's heart. He was looking for somebody that had a, a good and upright and perfect heart. That's what God was looking for. And he told Samuel in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, man looks on the outward, God looks on the inward. And so don't judge a thing he's telling Samuel by the way something looks when he went to the house of Jesse, wanting to anoint one of Jesse's sons as king. And uh, he was looking at all the men that were raised in that household. And the most unlikely one was a little shepherd boy looking after his father's sheep by the name of David. And David was a man after God's own heart. But God was a man after David's heart. And the thing about David's heart, even though uh, he was a very violent man, killed individuals, had immoral traits, but always within his heart, he was always leaning towards God. And always in his heart, he was looking for God in, in uh, elements of the uh, celestial world above, uh, in the earth beneath any element that was there, David found a way to express praise to God from water to a rock to a hill to a mountain to a bow and arrow to uh, using things like uh, stones and so on to address and direct praise and worship towards God. And so when a person has a good heart, I spoke about good and bad things in a pre previous service. When a person has a good heart, put your hand over your heart if you have one. Say, God above all. Say that again. Say, God above all. Give me a good heart. Uh, if, if, if evil is in your heart, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. And so even if you are in a very difficult situation in your life that uh, can command or can insist on bad behavior or not so good behavior, if you allow your heart to be darkened by that, in that pressure, in that difficult condition, stuff will come out of your heart. And so for me, there are times when something happens to me and the Lord says to me, you've got to fix that heart. And so I've got to keep on pouring the word, praise, worship, good things, because my heart issues come out of it. And so God must protect my heart. Because when your heart becomes darkened through envy, jealousy, and there's no reason to be envious or jealous, uh, or covetous, desirous of somebody else's stuff, all of those kinds of traits and attitudes, that it affects the quality of your heart. Because the kind of temple worship we have and the kind of Pentecostal demonstration we have can be mechanical. Lift up your hands, wave your hands, do a little dance, you know, fist bump the Lord. All of those kinds of things can be done without your mind engaging. Uh, your mouth can say things that you don't really believe. And your heart can be so distant from the Lord 
there could be a few minds that have drifted away and strayed from this present moment. And so what God is looking for is worship from your heart. Not just in church, but everywhere you are at any given moment. And so when God draws a man and or a woman into his inner circle, into the inner sanctum of his favor and blessing, it is at that point that that individual begins to attract enemies. So the very fact on the day you were conceived to the day you were physically born to where you are at present, you have attracted enemies. Enemies are attracted to do you harm, to slow you down, and or to hurt you. So uh, here are some uh, enemies that, that one can attract. Firstly, by actions, by your actions. You make a good decision. Not every person or every entity is happy that you've made a good decision. When you gave your heart to the Lord, you made a lot of enemies, both spiritually, definitely, and also physically, especially if you're in a house where, every, where so many people uh, uh, have a worldly lifestyle, uh, drinking, drugs, partying, etc., running with men, women, etc., etc., and now suddenly you give your heart to the Lord and your best friends that you used to drink with, used to mess around with, now suddenly you, you're refusing to on Fridays and Saturdays. Suddenly individuals that you thought were your friends become your enemies. And so we create enemies, number two, by bad decisions we make. And there are times when we make a bad decision not knowing it's a bad decision from uh, loaning money to someone irresponsible, selling an asset when you were not supposed to, uh, going to a different country when you weren't supposed to, uh, and the list can go on and on and on. Whatever decisions you make here in, in a bad time, bad place, you attract enemies. You attract enemies. Uh, Enemies are created when jealous people are around you. Not everybody is happy that you're wearing a yellow jacket, I can see too. Why is she wearing a yellow jacket? Well, because she can. But not everybody is happy that you're wearing a yellow jacket. Not everybody is happy that you are successful. Competition creates enemies. The whole of the universe is competing, one against another, one for a resource to survive, to live, to get ahead. Whether we like it or not, churches compete. They compete for membership, whether we say it or not. The reason we want good church, better music, good sound, a clean building, good lighting, available parking, is because not only do we want our members comfortable, but we want to attract members. And so uh, if you drive around the city, there are billboards that are dedicated to many ministries and churches because we are competing the one against the other. And so unfortunately, it, it creates enemies. I was told many, many years ago uh, when a group of people started attending our church, the pastor contacted me and said to me, you can take them all, but..." If you dare touch my business people, uh, you and I are going to have a, a thing together. I said, so what's the difference between a person and a business person? It's about the money, Angiji. We create enemies uh, from the day we're born. It's devils and demons and assigned spirits against us. But every time you enter into a, a new sphere of influence, a new sphere of operation, a new sphere of function. Along with that new level comes a new devil, new spheres. And so as you're getting to a new sphere of influence, a new sphere of power, uh, probably the following week I'll be teaching on signs and wonders and miracles and pushing through. But, but to get to different places, suddenly you begin to attract 
unwarranted problems and challenges. As long as you David privately killing, a, 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 you know, bears and lions and so on, uh, it's just a, a brother or two that might be a little envious or, or uh, strict that you're being too uh, mischievous and, and, and maybe going out there and doing things that you are being a bit irresponsible, trying to take on a bear and a lion. You know, you should have at least called one of us to come and help you. It's irresponsible. But now that you're killing Goliath, uh, not everybody is really happy that suddenly you've come from a simple household. Now the king is promoting you, and there are generals, uh, colonels, captains, lieutenants in the military that you've jumped. You haven't even gone through the ranks of, of uh, corporal, sergeant, staff sergeant, sergeant major, and, and now commissioned officers. You've gone straight to leading hundreds of individuals. And so there's a handful of people that are happy for you, but there's a whole lot of people that are not. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be jealous. Don't be jealous. And so, so all of, all, the Bible says that when David killed Goliath, all of Goliath's possessions came to David. Took Goliath's head, took his sword, his shield, and suddenly David had a tent, chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. But not only did he attract and bring all of, Dave, of Goliath's goods, he also now inherited all of Goliath's demons, all the devils that bothered Goliath, all of those things that were making Goliath go crazy, all of those now, through a spiritual soul tie, through a spiritual transfer, landed on King David. So instead of dealing with spirits of foxes and bears and lions, he's now dealing with spirits on a giant level. And if he was not a worshiper and a praiser, he would have struggled because if you recall, he was the one through his praise and worship that got rid of the devils that bothered King Saul, who was the tallest person in the kingdom. Now he's not only dealing with the family devils, he's not just dealing with Saul's devils that he uh, exercised, he's now having to deal with the devils that Goliath uh, had attracted and Goliath now brought. And so when David begins his journey, uh, Saul is happy for him, everyone's happy for him, they start their songs, and now David is going to find himself on the run. And because he was a worshiper, because he loved attending church, he was always doing something to show God glory. And so the scripture then is clear that one day he had to flee from the house of Saul because Saul uh, stopped uh, privately threatening him and uh, stopped privately giving him warnings that I'm going to take you out. He begins to publicly show it and demonstrate it over dinner, over family gatherings in, in the lounge area, and, and then uh, when the soldiers were gathered together and also now he chides Jonathan for being friends with David and tells Jonathan, I'm going to kill you along with your friend David. And David finds himself in a place that he'd never wanted to be and that is running for his life. Sisters and brothers, it's one thing to run, but now when you have to start running for your life, that's another story altogether. If, if you're running to, to climb the totem pole for success, if you're running to become more affluent, if you're running to, to become uh, wealthier and, and improve your living conditions, that's one thing. But now when you're running, looking over your shoulder because you don't know where the enemy is or who the enemy is, that's another story altogether. It's one thing if you're running in a place where it's easy to run where there's enough food, there's enough water, you have enough transportation, uh, there's enough uh, support and supply for you, it's easier to run there. But when you are running in the wilderness, you don't know who's adversarial, you don't know who's friendly, and, and then you're going to find yourself in a case, chapter 22 of 2 Samuel, where you have 400 men that come that don't have money, they have a, 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 a police record, uh, they are men that uh, are on the run and uh, they come in because they are needy, they are indisciplined and you have to train and teach all of them 
now suddenly trying to find food for yourself changes the way you have to find food for a number of men who are unable to do it. And the story begins to expand even more. And then at Ziklag, when all these men turn against you, and, and the only one that's standing for you is yourself. And you are leaning towards your own praise and worship, putting on an ephod, and trusting in the Lord with all your heart. And then when you become king, 11 tribes don't want to endorse you as a king. Your family does, your tribe does, but the rest of the nation doesn't endorse you as a king. And, and there's still strife between the old household and your household. And, and you know what God spoke to you in your years as a young boy, in your years in the wilderness. The reiteration that came from the various prophets uh, as early as Samuel and then Nathan, Gad, and then Abide the priest. And now that you are finally king and you are crowned king of Israel and uh, you have built your house and you now find yourself on the run again, now you are going to pray this prayer. Psalm number 61. Yeah, my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. And the scripture says in the book of Exodus, chapter number one and chapter two, when the Lord spoke to Moses, he said, I've heard the cries of my people. So they're the cries of the people. They are the cries of a family. But here David is saying, hear my cry, my individual cry. The person that is just a, a, an arm's length away from you is in dire need. Dire need, you wouldn't say it because they look comfortable under their mask. They look comfortable uh, uh, in their body language. But inside, the person next to you is dying a slow death. Don't know how to pray. Don't know uh, what to pray. Don't know when to pray. May not be sleeping at night. May not have transportation to, go, to get home. May not even have food to eat. May not have money uh, to pay a rent or to pay school fees or whatever the case might be. And I've come to church just to look for a bit of solace. And they've come here with an attitude deep in their heart. And I felt it when Tammy was leading, hallelujah, the great Mike Mann, there is a, a, a song that he put together. I felt something connect here because somebody here was lifting up a cry to the, to the Lord. It was a cry like, yeah, my cry. Oh God, it's my cry. I noticed they were twins. Are you identical twins? I noticed that. Are they, were they twins singing here today? Is the answer yes or no? The two girls on the end, you're twins. So how come you look the same? And you, the two of you there, those two, you look the same, you dress the same, you even laugh the same. <laughs> we already investigate the investigator. <laughs> and so, 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 uh, if you have twins and there's two at the back, they look the same, but they're so different. Each person, no matter how close they are, you have your own personal cry because you have your own personal challenge. My strength is not Chichi's strength. Chichi's strength is not my strength. My struggles are not her struggles. We have struggles as a family, struggles as a couple, struggles as a ministry, struggles as an individual ministry. And so when we pray to the Lord with corporate struggle, it's not the same as an individual struggle. Because the things of life that have shaped us and rolled us and made us what we are mentally and emotionally are not the same. We met when we were already adults. And so things that happened in our respective childhoods have, have, have shaped us in a different way. And so we approach life in a different way. And so David says, hear my cry. I'm the youngest of the boys. I'm the most unlikely person here to be chosen. I, I didn't ask for this job. I wasn't campaigning to be king. I didn't ask for Samuel to find me and put oil on my head. I was so happy being the praise and worship leader with my small little car church there, enjoying life all on my own and fighting my battles. But now I'm responsible for my family. I'm responsible for a military. I'm responsible for the nation. I'm responsible for God's agenda. It's just overwhelming. So hear my cry, O Lord, attend unto my plea. Attend unto my prayer. I, I'm asking you to hear my cry. 
I'm crying out of the depths of my heart, from my inner soul, from the inner sanctum of my emotions. I'm calling on you, God, to hear my prayer. While the entire neighborhood is fast asleep, not even a dog is barking, not even the roosters have crowed. I'm awake, my pillow is wet. Uh, I've made 101 trips to the bathroom and, and I still can't find a position. Pillows don't work, blankets are not working, medicine is not working, it's just my cry within. Hear my cry, O Lord. Put your hand over your heart, say, hear my cry, O Lord. Attend unto my prayer. The word attend here means be a personal waiter. Don't just dispense general answers. Ah, it's new life. We'll just give them a blanket answer. We'll just answer people's prayer. No, I need you to come to my table. I need you to come to my, my seat. Attend unto my prayer. It's a specific prayer. I don't eat onions. I don't want uh, tomatoes in this, in this answer. I, I don't want uh, 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 chicken with bones. I don't want lamb with bones. I don't want beef. I don't want a stew. I want a curry. I want a roast. I want a braai. I want medium well. I want it well done. It's my prayer. It's my request. It's my need. This is for me now. Attend unto my prayer. Hear my prayer. To the ends of the earth. In other words, from where the beginning of time was, from when the first man prayed to where I am. Whatever prayer you've attended to, this is my prayer. It may be similar, but it's not the same. Attend unto my prayer from the ends of the earth. When my heart is overwhelmed, shout when my heart is overwhelmed. Shout when my heart is overwhelmed. Sisters and brothers, life can be overwhelming. Coming from the United States and Dubai, coming home, we've noticed in respective countries, there are various things that overwhelm people. But coming back to Arari, life itself can be overwhelming. And there's people in this room who are so overwhelmed with life. And so pray the prayer with me. Hear my cry, O Lord. Whatever your cry is, take 10 seconds and ask God to answer your prayer. Come on, 10 seconds, whisper your prayer. A little person said, whisper a prayer in the morning. Whisper a prayer at lunchtime. Whisper a prayer in the evening. Whisper a prayer in the midnight hour. God's about to attend unto your prayer because someone in this room, your heart is overwhelmed. There's so much pressure on your life. Pressure to perform. Pressure to deliver. Pressure to provide answers. Pressure to open doors. Pressure to make a way for so many. God is about to take your overwhelmed heart and carry a weight that you're bearing. Your weight is heavy, but you shall be able to bear it. And he says, from the end of the earth, lead me to the rock. Shall lead me to the rock. David had seen many rocks. Oh yes, he had. He knew the scriptures well. And so he went back to the rock that Moses sat on when the very first battle Israel fought as a nation in Exodus chapter 17, when the Amalekites came against the children of Israel in an unprovoked attack. Joshua was asked to mobilize the men and fight the Amalekites in the valley while Moses went on top of the hill with her, his brother-in-law, and Aaron, his brother prophet, sat Moses on the rock. David knew that rock because that rock was Christ. But even though he was sitting on a rock, he needed her on his right and Aaron on his left to lift up these hands. There are times when you might be on the rock, Jesus, but you need someone to help you lift your hands because the weight of life is so heavy. David knew the rocks. Yes, he did. Because his great, great, great grandfather was running for his life and came to a place called Luz and found the rocks of that place. There were 12 rocks that Jacob found. 
and he chose the rock of Judah and made the rock of Judah his pillow because Judah was the one through him the Messiah would come. He placed his head on the rock of Judah. Judah the praiser. Judah had a lion's whelp coming out of him. David knew rocks. Can I preach rocks to you? He knew rocks. He knew rocks because he saw Moses take a rod and strike a rock and bring water out of a rock. David knew rocks. He saw a rock that Moses hit that forbid him to go into the promised land. I said, David knew rocks. He saw Joshua take 12 rocks out of the river Jordan and pile them up and said, write this as a memorial. When the people ask you, what meaneth these rocks? Tell them you are a people that were not a people. You had no name. God gave you a name. He has chosen you as a chosen generation, separated you out of the land of Egypt, and he has placed you up on high. David knew rocks. He found the rock when he killed Goliath, chose five out of a stream, and dropped the giant with one. But in this trial, when his heart was overwhelmed, he needed a rock that was higher than Moses' rock, higher than Mount Ararat, higher than the rocks of Joshua. He needed a rock that was higher than the rocks on the breastplate that will shine up in the time of need. Hear my prayer, O oh Lord. Attend unto my plea. Hear my prayer. Hear me where I am. I'm downcast. I'm overwhelmed. I'm struggling in my trouble. But lead me to the rock. Give me my rock. I said, lead me to the rock. The rock that David was looking for was the rock that Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. The rock you are looking for is in the future. Lead me to that rock. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Give God a praise, somebody. Whatever you do in this season, don't lose your mind. Point at a woman, say, baby girl, don't lose your mind. I said, don't lose your mind. Don't lose your mind. Don't lose your head. Turn to a man, say, don't lose your good sense. Oh yes, keep your good sense. Oh yes, keep your testimony. Look at four people, just say, keep your testimony. Keep it intact. Don't lose your testimony. Tell someone again, say, I'm praying for you that you don't lose your money. Don't lose your money. Let your money be safe. I feel like preaching here. Oh yes, it's taken you years to build what you have, to build your testimony, to build the grace of God. It's taken you a long time to get here. Build your strong tower. Take time building your strong tower. Build, but build wise. Build, but build strong. Build, build your name. I said build. Build your business and build and build your reputation. Build your product line. Build your relationships. Build your marriage. But as you are building, Build them with choice rocks of a testimony that God has brought you through, that God has delivered you from the mouth of the devil, that God has transferred power unto you. Oh yes, I'm building my tower. I'm building. And God, in the middle of my prayer, lead me to the rock as you hear my prayer. Hide me in your pavilion. 
Hide me in your strong tower. Hide me in your name. Hide me in your blessing. Hide me in your blood. The name of the Lord is a rock. I said the name of the Lord is a rock. The blood of Jesus is a rock. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. God, you've answered prayers for our father, Ezekiel Goody. Lead me to his rock that I can find a solace and an answer to prayer. You might say, lead me to Bishop's prayer. Lead me to Chi-Chi's prayer. Lead me to my brother's prayer. I'm telling you, in this month of October, God's gonna take you to a rock that is higher. 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 Lead me to the rock that is higher. I said, lead me. Lead me. Lead me to the rock. Lead me to the rock. Lead me to the rock. Give him a praise. Give him a praise, yes. Give him praise. Praise him for the rock that shall not be moved. Praise him for the rock that will stay forever. Praise him for the rock that you built your life and your testimony. Hallelujah. I give you praise, oh God. I praise you for many dangers, toils, and snares you brought me through. Clap your hands, everybody. Clap your hands. In the Garden of Gethsemane, there were three groups of people praying. The first group were eight apostles. They were in the courtyard. At least they were eight. Piano. Eight is the number of new beginnings. And then there were three. Peter, James, and John. They were in the holy place. They were also sleeping, but at least there were three. Because three is the number of three levels and dimensions. But in the holiest of holies, Jesus, the rock of ages, Jesus, the rock of all time, Jesus, the rock on which we build ourselves. All alone, his heart was overwhelmed. And he prayed here, my cry, O oh Lord. And you know what? God answered his prayer. God led him to the rock that was higher than him, and that was Calvary. He led him to the rock. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Led him all the way to the top of Calvary. And there he hung, shed his blood for every living human being, every human being that has died, every human being that is to come. Because whenever you go to a rock that is higher than you, ask Abraham on Mount Moriah. Ask Noah on Mount Ararat. Ask Jesus on Mount Calvary. Whenever you get to a rock that is higher than you, you always come down a better person. A better person. Say after me, say, hear my cry, O Lord. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry to you. From the end of the earth will I cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me. 
to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me and a strong tower from my enemy. I will always be in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 I am the Laraba Sombrero, Reven de Recation de Recumbalava, Andravandoro Condereve, Ratangarabuti Balacara, and the Reme, Sundalala Cushembereve, Unarara Cusembre Terebe, Rundoro Cusamalavataka. Rendere de que sendere be, rondoro lo cochere be, anda, charanda la cumba, sendre chere de cumba la basanda, urara la basendere be, ay araba sondu. Prophesy in my spirit, attend unto my need. Oh Lord, answer my prayer. Hear my cry, O oh Lord. Hear my plea, O oh Lord. <laughs> 